Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Brendan Graham Dempsey. Brendan's a writer, a poet, a farmer, and the director of the Sky Meadow Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting systems-based thinking about the things that matter most. Welcome back to the Jim Rudd Show, Brandon. Hey, Jim. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, this should be a lot of fun. Uh, Brandon appeared back in EP 172, where he talked about his book, Emergentism, A Religion of Complexity for the Metamodern World. So if, if this doesn't give you enough, Brandon, go check out EP 172. Today, we're going to talk about his new book, A Universal Learning Process, The Evolution of Meaning, and then book one, which we'll talk about all those things here in a minute. Uh, but before we jump in, I got to say, I love this fucking book. Uh, I read a lot of books and I read a fair number of books of this general genre. I'm going to explain it all down at City Hall, right? You know, the history of the universe. We know it all if we read this book. And generally, as my wife can report, as I read these books, I cuss and you know sometimes throw them against the wall because I inevitably find things that I think are just wrong or wrongheaded. Uh, my wife uh, asked me, what book are you reading? You know, you're not cussing, you're not fussing or anything like that. I go, no, this guy drilled it. Uh, I think it's an amazingly job well done. And it's only 94 pages. So uh, everything about everything in 94 pages. So congratulations, Brandon, for one of the most enjoyable, most well done books of this sort. Probably the most well done book of this sort that I've ever read. Wow. High, high praise. Thank you so much. That means a lot coming from you and um, I'm really glad to hear it. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing what small bits of difference and disagreement we can milk for an extended uh, debate conversation. Uh, but no, I, I really appreciate you saying that. And um, yeah, that was, that was kind of the goal. And I, I hope that it's uh, concise, but not too concise. Yeah, it's, it's very excellent. Now, a little minor bitch. <laughs> the title doesn't really do justice to the book, I don't think. While indeed there is a theme of learning as a universal process across the book, it's actually much more than that. So what's the logic of the title? Yeah. Well, so the real title is the evolution of meaning. And a universal learning process is really just really the entry, the, the introduction, the first chapter to that much longer work. Um, I decided to release this project, this, this work, uh, The Evolution of Meaning, as a book series because kind of my original intention was to write maybe some kind of thousand page tome. And when you kind of drop that out into the world, you know, receptions can vary. And uh, so I thought this might just be more effective to serially release this work so that one, you know, people have more time to kind of engage it and digest it and uh, that sort of a thing. And two, just so that these can also, to some degree, serve as certain kinds of standalone books on, on you know, in their own term. So I, I think of this very much as the entry point, the introduction, the, the first chapter to a very large book. But in this case, it's sort of a book that is an introduction to a book series. So the, the overall scope of this project is very, I would say, ambitious, and it's really tackling the evolution of meaning. So I think that's a better way of thinking about the, what this is a part of. And this is sort of the um, kind of getting our bearings oriented putting it all in context, sort of setting the stage book in that series. Yeah, so it sounds like a better way to think about this, even though it's not the way Kindle presents it, is the evolution of meaning, part one, a universal learning process. Yeah, well, you know, never trust uh, never trust Kindle or Amazon. They'll, they'll uh, mislead you. But uh, no, it, it really was as sort of a, a condescension just to the nature of, you know, trying to present this material in, a, in an accessible way that didn't uh, overload people, or that also didn't have to make me wait, you know, however many years before I'm done this whole large work before I put it out there for people. But yeah, so there, I, you know, maybe some tweaking to be done in terms of how I frame and market this uh, going forward. Yeah. The uh, other thing I do, another complaint, I did have a couple of minor bitches <laughs> here. Uh, the Kindle version has no table of contents. Mm. You might check on that. 
Sure. I, uh, when I'm, especially when I'm prepping for a podcast, I'm always hopping back and forth. And then, you know, I go to my PDF or I put my notes in and I always want to go to the, use the table of contents, no table of contents. Uh, but fortunately I was able to synthesize one. That's uh, well, I'll tell you the funny story later, how I did that. Okay. And then before we actually jump in one last thing, this is book one of the broader story. Just if you're, if you've gotten there yet, what are the other pieces that you see coming? <laughs> Well, that would be its own conversation, I suppose. Really, the scope of this is to trace, well, as the name suggests, the evolution of meaning. And of course, what then do we mean by that? So in this work, I outline a theory of meaning, which we'll be mainly discussing. But then the real goal of the project is to track that development of that form of meaning, primarily through cultural evolution. So the first couple of books in the series are going to kind of set things up. This one sets up the theory and the basic way of thinking about meaning and evolution. The next two kind of zoom in on the symbolic learning process that happens specifically at the level of human culture and the linguistically mediated meanings that show up at that level. And it does it first looking at the individual sort of maps that we have for that, and then at the collective ways that we can think about sociological learning. And then it unites those into sort of an integration of individual collective processes that are in a dynamic feedback loop. So all that sort of some theoretical underlaboring that has to happen in the first uh, three books or so before then moving into kind of giving a big picture overview of what the various kind of phases or stages of human meanings have looked like over the course of our human uh, evolutionary history. And then the rest of the, the bulk of the rest of the work will have a book apiece on each of those meaning systems moving from, you know, Neolithic hunter gatherer forager societies on into early agricultural states on into, you know, the axial age, modernity, post-modernity, and then meta-modernity. And kind of uh, bringing all that I can to bear on articulating clearly what meaning sort of looks like at, at those various moments in the process. And then the last portion of the book is going to focus on sort of conclusions or, or implications or some analysis at that point of like, what do we make of all this? And is there a deeper story here? And uh, kind of do some early gestures towards some kind of philosophical, existential, maybe even theological work. So that's the whole scope of this evolution of meaning series, which again, will probably be like 10 books long and maybe around 100 to 150 pages per chapter slash book in this case. So something like that. That's sort of the, the scope of it. Ah, well, that's uh, exceedingly interesting. And unless you start to write sucky books, I'd like to, <laughs> in advance, uh, invite you to send me the proofs when they get within a couple of months of pub and see if we can uh, schedule a pub day or pub week mm. podcast. Because my uh, other authors, more commercially minded, perhaps, uh, say that if you can get a bump, even 50 or 100 books on Amazon in the first week, it'll kick the algorithm into gear looking for buyers. That I, well, yeah, let's definitely do that. And, you know, Amazon and the algorithm need a good kick. So, yeah, um, right in the I balls would... mostly. But <laughs> so, if I could kick Amazon's algorithm in the balls, I'm happy to do it, right? especially for things that I think are good. Well, so, thank you. Uh, yeah. Now, you did mention theology. And uh, one of the things I was going to say before we hopped in, it's so one of the things I definitely noticed and liked, of course, was there is essentially no religion in this book. The word religion appeared twice both times in passing, and the first occurrence wasn't until page 73 out of 94. Uh, in contrast, in emergentism, religion appeared 124 times. Uh, so maybe just a brief word about why you didn't mention the R word this time. Yeah, well, again, in part because, well, I, I think the biggest reason is those are, these are two very different books. The emergentism book is really meant for a, a kind of popular audience to try to give a very, very kind of big picture uh, take on very similar kinds of ideas. But again, not really bringing in, I mean, that, for example, that book, the notes uh, were just a kind of small supplementary thing that I added online. Whereas this book, uh, around a third of this, uh, this whole book is, uh, is end notes. Um, so there's 94 pages of text, but probably like uh, 50 pages of notes or something like that. And so this book is, is in a very different register. It's really trying to harness, bring together, uh, assemble as much of the kind of scientific and academic literature on the topics that pertain to this inquiry as possible and try to be very uh, thorough, very comprehensive in terms of uh, attending to all of that. So the emergentism book was just, yeah, aimed at a, a different kind of audience. And it was a much more sort of um, a, a looser kind of way of talking about these things that hopefully, you know, was 
accessible and appealing and, and, and so certainly very meaningful, but aimed at a different audience. But at the other reason is because this is just the beginning. Um, I hate to disappoint you, but there will be <laughs> some uh, movement into questions of religion, as I think there has to be if you're going to assess human meaning making over the cultural record. And religion is such an important part of that. But in terms of being able to descriptively talk about religious evolution versus um, more kind of speculatively or philosophically engage it uh, in the way that I was kind of doing in emergentism, that kind of second move is only going to happen in the kind of concluding chapters of this new work is sort of, you know, uh, a gesture in that direction. But on the whole, the main purpose for writing this whole project is to kind of make a case or present an argument as thoroughly as possible, rather than sort of making grand statements and gestures. Um, and so I, I will move into, you know, that kind of material, but I want to maintain the same level of sort of rigor and uh, integrity and whatnot as I do so. So it will, even though I will move into that content, also continue to be a very different kind of work as I do that. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to that, actually, because you're building a very firm foundation here, which I can see how you can use as you ratchet up to uh, higher levels. And I like the idea of the historical analysis. And obviously, religion has been a huge force in uh, human cultural evolution uh, for as long as we can dig back into the uh, historical record. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd love to see the, uh, you know, the so strong bottom up foundation brought to that analysis. That, mm -hmm. that should be a lot of fun. So the book really starts off with, you know, what is meaning? Why meaning? meeting matters to people, why meaning is important, etc. cetera. Uh, so why don't you start with that a little, but let's not get to the punchline on what you exactly think meaning is, which I think is the best part of the book. Okay. We'll do that as separate little concentrated sure. chunk. So yeah, um, I mean, framing this is uh, the question of mm, when we look out and we are, you know, thinking about the state of the world today and we're thinking about what uh, people are grappling with, especially around issues of mental health and uh, a crisis on that front. Obviously, your you know audience will be familiar with the work of say John Verveke and his talk about the meaning crisis. There's a lot of concern uh, and interest, a kind of urgent interest in the issue of meaning. Uh, I don't think accidentally that's really come to the fore uh, over the past. It seems to have almost accelerated, you know, in in, in recent memory though. So I I don't want to put a kind of uh, sense of where this started. Obviously, <laughs> the whole our claim of the book is that meaning has been a driving aspect of human culture from the beginning. But there's a kind of intensity to the, these questions right now. And when we see certain kinds of breakdown in terms of people's uh, well-being, and we look at that also at the collective level of grappling with issues of meaning or meaninglessness in our sort of uh, society and uh, in our kind of cultural frames that we're operating in, um, there's seems to be this recognition that that meaning is really important, uh, whatever that means, right? And so um, I think that that can be a kind of helpful way into this is sort of um, trying to then talk about, well, what do we actually mean by meaning? Why is it uh, registering to us as something very essential? And if we can kind of get our heads around that in a way that seems to have some kind of theor theoretical rigor to it, then these maybe more amorphous notions of a meaning crisis or a collective crisis of malaise or despair or nihilism, etc., can begin to come into relief a little bit and we can actually start to um, move the dialogue a little bit on those issues. So I don't know, that'd be one way into why meaning. Um, and that's sort of what then the book tries to tackle. Yeah, that's good. And it's funny because uh, obviously I talked to a lot of people about the meaning crisis, etc. And sometimes I go, oh, that meaning crisis, kind of poo-poo it a little bit. And I uh, give an example. You know, I say, you know, meaning crisis. Well, I know when the sky gets light in the east, it means that the sun's going to come up in an hour. And so, and this actually ties in for the first time, your definitions <laughs> of meaning tie very closely to this kind of snarky redism. And I say, then sometimes I'll say further, if people want to go further on, I say, you know, the uh, animal I study for cognitive uh, science of consciousness often is the white-tailed deer. And it's a crepuscular creature, which means it does most of its eating just before the sun goes down and just uh, just before the sun comes up or right around the time the sun comes up. So for a white-tailed deer, the sky getting light in the east is very meaningful. Mm. It means it's time to get out of bed and uh, get yourself positioned for eating uh, and you have about an hour because you really want to be out of there soon after the sun comes up and you become more visible to predators and what such. So it's a, a perfectly reasonable form of meaning, though when people talk about the meaning crisis, they generally don't mean, they don't say that. They don't mean that because certainly the sky's going to get light in the east. Uh, but nonetheless, 
your definition of meaning is so much closer to my little snarky example than it is to the handkerchief ringing uh, meaning crisis stuff. So why don't you start talking about what you are pointing to when you say meaning? Yeah. Well, ha. Huh. So uh, let's see. Let's see how we can do this in a way that uh, you know doesn't get us too far out of our in front of our skis. I guess. So I guess I would say um, the way that I'm approaching this is. Uh, when we talk about meaning, we're talking about a kind of knowledge or information of a particular sort. And that is specifically the sort of information that causally impacts or causally bears on the viability of an organism in context. And that's sort of a rough uh, kind of way into this. And, uh, and it's a way of thinking about what we mean by meaning. Uh, that also allows for there to be successive layerings and emergent kind of uh, versions of this so that it doesn't become crudely reductionistic. Uh, I'll probably wind up coming back to that a number of times because I don't want to give people the wrong impression uh, by, uh, by what I'm talking about here. But simply put, yeah, meaning is the way that an organism, or let's say more broadly, in any entity in its context, in its environment, um, in its field, sort of leverages the mutual information linking it to that environment in such a way as causally bears on its uh, well-being, its continued persistence, its growth, and its uh, flourishing, which is a very broad way of thinking about it, but it's a sufficiently broad way of thinking about it that then we can then do the work that this whole series is aimed to, which is trying to expand uh, and track the evolution of that basic conception through the various levels uh, that it undergoes uh, in terms of its transformation from, you know, the simplest of entities in the in the universe to the most complex. So that's a very quick summary version. And then, uh, of course, there's a lot to unpack from all of that. Yeah, I, th I actually really like that because it was able to ground meaning in that exact sense back before life, even, as you point out, mm -hmm. right? Meaning is anything that uh, is supportive of the maintenance of some homeostatic cycle that has neg entropy. And uh, so maybe before we move on, uh, you, you kind of do it in passing, but you come back to dissipative systems a few times. Mm -hmm. Might be worth telling the audience about Purgosian's theory of dissipative systems and how uh, far from equilibrium uh, cycles essentially may just be nothing more than a more efficient way to burn energy. Yeah. Yeah, so this, as, a, in, as an introduction to this big project exploring meaning and value, attempts a kind of first principles approach to the topic, which others are also attempting, and it's a very important uh, project for various reasons. For me, the best way to do that is basically trying to find a way of situating meaning uh, within as much as we can kind of get at it, uh, you know, the fabric of reality, you could say, you know, philosophers talk about carving nature at its joints. And when we try to understand these kinds of processes unfolding through cosmic complexification, we're looking for those joint points, we're looking for those, you know, kind of key thresholds and emergences, but we're also looking for kind of what can be tracked all the way down. And so, for me, the best way of kind of beginning to get a first principle sense of what we mean by meaning is linking uh, the concept to notions of energy and information and ultimately the second law of thermodynamics, which, you know, famously has been sort of acknowledged as being one of those deep kind of, un if there's an unbreakable law of physics, it's often credited uh, to the second law of thermodynamics. And the basic notion uh, is that we live in an entropic universe and that uh, gradients will dissipate and differences will homogenize. And this is sort of this kind of deep tendency to natural processes that, as best as we can tell, is uh, more or less something we can treat as a first principle. And if that's sort of a fundamental aspect of the physical cosmos that we inhabit, of course, the big question is, well, how do we then see order and complexity emerge in a cosmos sort of geared towards uh, uniformity, homogeneity, and a lack of differentiation? And so you get this really important recognition that for there to be differentiated entities, you need energy that needs to do that differentiating. Otherwise, basically, the, the opposite will occur and things will sort of... Uh, lead towards equilibrium where there's all just this uh, everything's jarbled up there's no differences that are kind of recognizable and everything is homogenous so 
if you don't want, you know, homogeneity, uh, then you need some kind of energy to come into that system and create differences to kind of separate things and keep them distinct and inform them. So all form requires some energy uh, by means of which those forms can take shape. And so this is one of the profound insights that we get from sort of non-equilibrium thermodynamics um, and the kind of dissipative structures and dissipative systems that were kind of explored and discovered and pre was really, you know, key for that insight. And so one of the things that we learn is that this process can occur, that it does occur sort of spontaneously, uh, that the very second law of thermodynamics that tends towards the dissipation of gradients can itself generate order in order to basically more effectively, more efficiently dissipate those energy gradients. So you get this emergent order as a very consequence of the tendency to disorder and homogenization and equilibrium. And so from that kind of starting place, you get this really profound process that can potentially ratchet it itself up and build order on order and complexity on complexity. And so people might be thinking, well, what does this all have to do with meaning, etc.? So for me, being able to communicate uh, notions of basically the enduring state of existence for an entity in a, an environment, if that's going to continue, then there needs to be a kind of energetic exchange that is informing that entity in context. And that's going to create an informational relationship where uh, there is going to then be correlated information between entity and environment in such a way that some of that bears directly on the continued existence uh, of that entity in that context. And that's what we would call meaning. And so the work of folks like Artemy Kolchinsky uh, and David Wolpert, Carlo Rivelli have done some really important work using information theory and uh, far from equilibrium thermodynamics to begin to fill in this account of uh, information and energy by talking about semantic information and meaningful information. And I'm really just using a lot of that as a construct to be able to, in a sense, ratchet myself up uh, theoretically based on that into appreciating all the different, uh, more complex and sophisticated kinds of meaning that emerge through cosmic evolution based on that kind of core premise and, and process. Yeah, I really love your use of in-form as a uh, signature and kind of gloss on information. Because in you know, a lot of my own thinking and the many other people in the complexity world, not everybody, do think that constraint has a whole lot to do mm. with uh, far from equilibrium entities. Basically, information, when actually instantiated as physical processes, constrain the system. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, all my atoms don't just go flying off. Right. They're all stuck together. And uh, and further, uh, you know, things like top down causality. I decide to go to the store to get a candy bar. Uh, the probability of a carbon atom in my ass deciding to go to the store five miles up the road is essentially zero on its own. But the fact that it's stuck in my ass means that uh, when I want a candy bar, that carbon molecule is going along for the ride. And those are, you know, huge constraints on what you'd otherwise expect to be the values. Right? And, you know, I don't even know why you invite me to explain these things when you do such a much more eloquent job yourself in articulating the same. Yes. Yeah, so, no, that's exactly right. And, okay. One other thing, hugely important. Again, you did a brilliant job on this. Uh, so much better than any I can remember is the distinction between Shannon information and semantic information. It was goddamn unfortunate that Shannon called his thing information theory. Because it, yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to steal your thunder. Uh, why don't you do that? I'll try my best, though. I will say, I mean, this is some really deep stuff that uh, it, it is. It, it's hard to wrap your head around. And there's a lot of ways that it's not too hard to go to run afoul with these terms because they overlap. They're used differently. And yet they they relate to each other. Uh, I, I tried to be very careful in the book relating these together because it is very easy for there to be these slippages. So, you know, I can try to express that here, but I think that, you know, it, it'll just be kind of an off-the-cuff off, off the cuff version of this. And um, again, I just try to be very, very careful in the book itself and the language that I use. But essentially, the way that I think about it is, you know, Shannon gives us a sense of information that doesn't really say what information is for, what it means. It's really just a kind of objective measure of accuracy, you could say. Like uh, the example I give in the book is if I send you, Jim, an email with a billion random numbers, as long as you get that information, quote unquote, that I sent you and it matches, you know, what I sent, then you have, quote unquote, received information. 
And just in a Shannon sense, that is then, you know, that kind of ticks that box. Of course, the thing is, if you have an email with a billion random numbers in it, that's totally useless to you and you don't have any actual need. Or, and you would say that that's not information for anything. And it's not something, therefore, that you would value. Uh, it has no meaning to you. And so we use a word like information in Shannon's sense. But the way that we use that term more colloquially tends to suggest more about information about, information for, and that's the semantic quality of information that's missing from kind of classic Shannon information theory. And that's really then the question that even apparently Shannon and Weaver and other folks were trying to answer, which is like, well, so how do we start accounting for, you know, meaningful information? What The, the meaning of information itself, how do we even do that using this um, kind of way that we framed it? And they weren't really successful in doing that. I think it's only been relatively recently with, by some of those folks that I named, uh, Artemy Kolchinsky and David Walpert and others, who have really, for the first time, been able to use kind of classic Shannon information theory on its own terms, but be able to bring in the semantic aspect to it and be able to finally address how do we use this incredibly powerful language for talking about you know information in terms of bits and whatnot and quantifiable and accuracy and all that. How do we use that language but to get at the aboutness of information? What can information be about? And, and here's the important part too, not just what can it be about in some way that we can use it to be about something, you know, because we can do that all sorts of ways. I can use information theory, let's say, to, and then I can impute from above a kind of meaning to it and, and, and use it that way. But that's not the question here. It's sort of like intrinsically, what can information be about, which is a harder question to get at. And what uh, Walpert and, and, and Kolchinsky and this kind of new approach uh, that comes out of, uh, you know, the kind of complexity uh, far from equilibrium thermodynamics take on this question is that information can be about an informational entity in context in its continued uh, existence. When we think about entities in context and we think about them as being distinct from their environments and therefore having a kind of informational identity, you could say, that needs to con convey itself through time, then there's an intrinsic, you know, you could say, forness <laughs> or aboutness of information to that entity relative, you know, to its environment. And so that was sort of the insight that came that allowed us to use kind of information theory to have an intrinsic semantic aspect to it. And that is what then constitutes genuinely meaningful information is the, the information that an entity has in a sense about itself, but also about its context and the, and the correlation between the two that bears on its continued existence. And so that's, that's where you get the real sense of meaning in information uh, in a really groundbreaking way that had never really been articulated before. Yeah, I love it because it's essentially relational. And, mm -hmm. uh, and when you get into towards complexity, I always find that thinking about things as relations rather than as static objects is an important part of the thinking. Yes. And uh, I'm gonna have to go back and read that paper. Uh, that one slipped in on me and I, maybe I have to have Wolpert on. I know Wolpert pretty well. He's a, a quite interesting character. And uh, so, yeah, that's very well well said. And uh, I, the other thing you said, I don't know if it was this part of the book, but you described uh, this kind of semantic information as relating the entity to its field, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and go back to my little homey example, the white-tailed deer. Uh, the deer is in his field, literally in a field <laughs> behind my house. Mm -hmm. When the, the light starts in the east, uh, he gets up, goes and starts munching. And guess what? He's preserving his neg entropy by providing himself energy to be able to stay far from equilibrium, i.e. Yep. not be dead. So, yep. you know, the story actually hangs around. So the uh, the sky getting light in the east is semantic information for the deer. Yeah, and this does open up some really interesting ways, which, you know, I'm sure we'll unpack a little bit of um, the different meanings of meaning as well, as well as the the way that they can often over or, uh, overlap or, or relate to each other. I mean, when I, let's say, uh, interpret my surroundings, then in a kind of semiotic sense, there might be meaning that's coming through there. But that is related to, but also different from the kind of meaning that I'm talking about, right? You could also, let's say, interpret semiotically the meaning of a kind of uh, totally useless and insignificant passage or text or something. You could get that email I mentioned earlier, and you could understand uh, what little meaning is there. You could kind of uh, semiotically interpret that meaning. But it's not until you're using kind of semiotic meaning 
uh, interpretation in a manner that actually bears on your own viability and continued existence, that it actually becomes kind of meaningful information in the sense that we're talking about. So uh, this becomes really important at the human culture level where we use language to do this. But I mean, one of the main points in this structuring this book is um, that there are various kinds of information that are being processed for meaningful information in that way. And so you have to be able to have the sense of the meaning of that information in that way, but also you you know it's using that kind of information in a way that bears on your viability that makes it truly kind of existentially meaningful in the sense that I'm really trying to track. Yeah, I love this because it's you don't need any big woo woo bullshit, right? <laughs> this is uh, you know this is the real deal here, right? And I'm sure you'll eventually find a way to get to some <laughs> woo woo bullshit, uh, but fortunately it'll be seven volumes from now, and you'll have hopefully built a levels of foundation, and then Rut will become a believer in woo woo bullshit, right? That's and that's the goal. That's the that's goal. That's the goal. That's yeah. the goal. That's that's a good show. So you know <laughs> you know the people say when you write a book you should write for one person, so you should write for me, and your goal is to convert me to woo woo bullshit. Right. I'll dedicate the the evolution of meaning to you, and uh, yeah, your your soul conversion is my soul uh, uh, meaning. <laughs> Now, I don't recall if you actually use these words, but in my own notes, I said one of the things that you're trying to get across is meaning as adaptive information. Does that hmm. resonate with you? Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, just kind of a different way of saying what we've already been talking about, which is, um, you know, th there's a number of ways of languaging this, um, and adaptive information is, I think, you know, Bobby Azarian uses that term a lot, and I'm sure is getting it from some of these um theorists directly. That's just another kind of term for, for what we're getting at. There's in Shannon's sense, right, information, kind of an infinite amount of possible quote unquote information, but only a very small subset of like information in that sense is actually information that can be used adaptively by an organism or an entity in context to sustain itself. And so that's the kind of information that we're concerned with. And so, uh, yeah, the degree to which information aids an entity in being adaptive is a particular kind of knowledge. And now, closely related, and this is part of the discussion I, again, also very much enjoyed, uh, distinguishing but showing the relationship between value and meaning. And yeah. So let's talk about what you mean when you say value. Yeah, well, this is really huge. And, and, and I almost want to say that there's a there's certainly a way in which when I talk about meaning, this is already implicit in there anyway, but it it's almost gets more to the aspect uh, that I'm really trying to explore because, I, you know, I could set it up this way and it bears on the way we began the conversation, which is a lot of people have this notion that value, what I value, what I care about, what I, what's important to me is just subjective. It's just, uh, you know, we all have our different values. We all have our different uh, interests in this sort of a thing, but it's a purely kind of subjective affair and similar with meaning, you know, it's like, oh, you've got your meaning, I've got mine, but you know, we live in a pluralistic world. And so everyone's got their own different meanings and there's no kind of there there to it. It's just something that's in your head. And so we very much come to think about meaning and value as sort of social constructions is kind of the t popular way of talking about it. And then of course, in kind of postmodern discourse, this is the way these things almost, um, you know, they're talked about in these terms in almost kind of a unanimous way. Like there's no other way of really even considering these ideas. They're just kind of inventions of culture. And obviously there's a, there's a way in which that just doesn't really sit well with us at certain levels. We can see it in some ways. We're like, well, yeah, okay, we see that cultures differ. And so there are different values and different people have different values that they might, you know, prioritize for, over others. But we also see that there is something deeper going on there. And we haven't really done a very good job of trying to parse out what is sort of common and universal and what sort of, you know, particular and contingent. And so this is a way of, I hope, kind of really responding to that confusion and helping us move past this kind of radically oversimplified notion that meaning and value are just, you know, invented arbitrary subjective social con constructs. Uh, let me throw, don't let me jump in here with one of my favorite Ruddisms. Okay. Uh, that when I hear this, everything is socially constructed. I, my first response is I've never met a postmodern plumber or farmer because hmm. they have to deal with reality. <laughs> uh, and so no plumbing is not, I mean, yes, it's postly constructed in some sense, but it's not arbitrary, right? It's uh, informed by reality. Mm -hmm. What a concept. Right. Anyway, continue. No, yeah. And, and there are more or less sophisticated ways we can even deconstruct these kind of deconstructive notions. And I think these are the kinds of conversations that, that are really, you know, necessary and important. And I'll just, again, to connect that to the opening, it's like a lot of the sense of the confusion around meaning and purpose and value that 
constitutes the conditions for our contemporary meaning crisis, such as it is, I think directly stems from these kinds of confusions is that people don't really know how to have meaning or value in the world. And it, given what they've been told, these things supposedly are. And so this account of meaning gives us a new way of approaching these things and specifically with how we understand value. So one way of getting into this way of thinking about it is is really just pretty simple, right? We tend to talk about things as being good or bad, and it's pretty easy to see how those are mm, probably pretty quickly things that fall apart once you actually do some reflection on them, right? Like, well, for you, the movie was good, but uh, he thought it was bad or what have you, right? Those kinds of things. Even when we kind of really unpack them in a kind of a rigorous philosophical way, we can see that there are all these aspects to good and bad that are kind of reifications. Uh, you know, we make a thing out of these things that are actually more nuanced and sophisticated. And so what we actually lack, I think, is the contextual aspect of this, what we mean by good and bad, which is more like good for and bad for which is a move into a relativist direction. But again, it doesn't end in a kind of radical relativism because more or less postmodern notions of, uh, of these things will, will get you there. They're like, oh, well, that's just good for you and bad for this other person. But that doesn't necessarily help us in terms of getting our heads around what these things are. But what I want to suggest is that when we're talking about good for and bad for, uh, this really does uh, have direct impinging you know, qualities on what a th an entity is in its context, right? Does an entity continue to exist or does it not? There's a certain way that these kinds of things do kind of bottom out, you could say. And so if there is going to continue to be Brendan Graham Dempsey in my particular informational configuration, then there are going to be uh, normative aspects to that right? I, I will not continue to be under some conditions, and I will continue to be under other conditions. And so to the degree that, you know, uh, that is, well, here's the thing, of value to me, then there's going to be these sets of possibilities that are either worse or better or good or bad for me. And you can extend this kind of more generally into any informationally organized entity in its context. And so, in a way that does bottom out in kind of a philosophical way, which would take a little bit of unpacking, you can see this process for any kind of far from equilibrium entity. If there is a thing, then it has a kind of normative uh, orientation towards its own being. Not in any conscious sense, uh, necessarily, right? A rock is just a rock, a table's a table. They, they're not aware of, them, of themselves as entities or anything like that. But just by the virtue of the fact that those things are things and therefore differentiated informationally and energetically from their background surrounding context, then there is information correlating them to that uh, background context in such a way that a subset of that that causally bears on its continued existence. And this is sort of the aspect uh, that eventually produces the kinds of teleological aspects that we see in biology and culture, but that can be rooted in much deeper uh, down aspects at the just the purely material level. And we can, we already talked about dissipative structures, which just at the level of matter exhibit this sort of uh, normative or teleological or teleodynamic kind of orientations because there are normative aspects for them to continue to be. And as long as there's a normative aspect for something to continue to be, there will be a good for and a bad for, there will be value for. And so that's a kind of thermodynamic framing uh, at the base level of value in such a way that we can actually track through the complexification process um, how it evolves into uh, higher order versions of that that we eventually experience at the level of human beings. You know, I was reading that section, I had a thought. Uh, this is probably the kind of things you're going to get to in your later volumes. But there's also in defining good for, uh, there's a framing question. What membrane or boundary you're thinking about? And the example I came up with mm. in my head very quickly was let's imagine the religion of the Shakers. The Shakers were a weird religion who had a rule, no sexual intercourse. Uh, guess what? They had a really strong tensity to die out. Uh, now, it may have been for the individuals that their lives were great. They didn't have kids or spouses to annoy them, right? They had plenty of time to contemplate and work on their hobbies and all that. And so from the frame of, uh, you know, Billy Bob, who's a member of the Shakers in Iowa in uh, 1888, uh, his existence might have been fine at the frame of the individual, but at the frame of the movement, 
uh, that set of uh, values, sexual intercourse is bad, means that the Shakers are going to have a hell of a time maintaining themselves over time. And sure enough, the last Shaker died, I think it was in uh, uh, 1955, something like that. So I think the, the quick takeaway here, and again, I just, you'll get into more and talk about sociology, is that the frame matters when you're talking about value. Well, yeah, I mean, and that raises a really important question, which I think we have to be careful because these things do undergo complexification. So by the time we're talking about these dynamics at the human culture plane, there's so much more complex kind of phenomena in which the individual is embedded that we have to do a different kind of calculus. Whereas if you go down to simpler entities, less complex entities at just kind of the structural material plane, it's a bit more direct. So even uh, that's part of the story I want to tell here as well, because um, maybe some people listening to me talk are, are thinking, hey, the version of this sounds pretty familiar, you know, functionalism, this sort of a thing. That's kind of reductive. And I want to be clear that that's not just what I'm talking about, that like there were these older notions, uh, functionalist notions that uh, well, morality and value and all these things can just be reduced down to what's good for people or bad for people and dot, dot, dot. And so these can be ultimately assessed at the level of evolution. And so all of that just sort of uh, gets reduced, you could say, to the biological level and various kinds of evolutionary processes at lower levels down. And that's not the claim that I'm making. I'm trying to rather identify a particular dynamic or a process or a mechanism that itself undergoes levels of complexification and emergence through cosmic evolution. So that by the time we get to very complex individual uh, human beings on the culture plane engaged in religious justification systems, etc., you're already dealing with a whole different milieu, which is really important to uh, unpack a bit, and hopefully we'll get a, a moment at least to talk about this, where my relative values are linked up with other people's relative values. And in fact, to even be a human individual is inherently to be a kind of collectivized, enculturated, socialized, transpersonal being. And so I do want to kind of make that point there. But the other thing I'll just say briefly is that we can talk about entities and contexts, and then we can think about the different scales that those unfold at. But in a sense, what's going on there is itself part of what is complexifying. So we just have to be clear about what we're talking about and in which context and, uh, and, and what is, and this is also really important, what's continuous and what's discontinuous as this process um, unfolds through complexification. Because there will be these deep continuities that go all the way down to thermodynamics. And then there are these other things that are emergent that show up uh, only higher up the stack. And so we've got to be kind of specific about what we're unpacking at any given moment. Yeah, and I love that too. You know, you did a very nice job of uh, you know talking about the fact that there's both emergence and there's a bottom route as well, and both are real, both mm. are equally real. And the, uh, the naive Newtonians uh, don't understand that emergence is every bit as real as atoms, mm. uh, right? And then the, uh, the the idealists, I suppose you could say at the far extreme, they don't believe in atoms at all. They don't <laughs> exist. It's all in your fucking head, dude. And I go, I don't think so, but maybe. Uh, you know, I can't prove it or disprove it. You know, it's a, uh, in fact, I, this is one of the little ruddy and rips. So I'm going to have to do this. Is that as I famously hate metaphysics, uh, but I also admit that any metaphysical proposition could be true. And in fact, weird shit like the universe just flicked into existence five seconds ago with all of our memories in place and all ballistic objects in motion. And in five seconds from now is going to flick out of existence. I cannot disprove that, actually. Mm. And so the uh, uh, the level of things that can not be disproven is infinite. And so even your most horseshit metaphysical bullshit might be right. But uh, <laughs> I just don't think so. Anyway, let's move on quickly here. I was going to do a longer section on this, but we're digging deep. So uh, something that's quite relevant to your moving of this ideas up in scale complexification is Greg Henrique's uh, you talk mm -hmm. for listeners may remember those who listen to them. I did uh, three episodes with Greg EP 176, 177 and 179, where we dug into his book, A New Synthesis for Solving the Problem of Psychology, Addressing the Enlightenment Gap. And you can get more you talk than you could eat uh, if you want to listen to those three episodes. So maybe in five minutes, seven minutes, if you can tell me, don't tell me, I know all about it. Tell the audience, what is UTALK and how does it tie into what you're trying to do? Yeah, so uh, UTALK uh, stands for the Unified Theory of Knowledge. Um, it is a kind of broad meta-theoretical framework uh, to 
provide a sort of architecture for the different planes of, of complexification that have emerged over the course of cosmic evolution. That's one of the things it offers. It came about because uh, Greg Enriquez, who's a professor at uh, the University of Madison, Madison University, he's a professor of psychology, and he was grappling with the issue of how psychology doesn't really have a very good uh, theoretical framework for what people even mean by psychology, the psyche, etc. His kind of conclusion was that we hadn't done a very good job situating the mind and, and and the psyche sort of in the broader naturalistic story. So whereas you go uh, into the realms of physics and biology, those people have a pretty good sense of what they're studying. By the time you get to psychology, people don't really uh, agree on what they're talking about. So he was able to situate what we mean by psychology within a kind of naturalistic narrative of cosmic evolution and complexification. And a key aspect of that is what he calls the tree of knowledge system, which is just a way of mapping these different emergent planes as they showed up in, uh, in big history. So out of a kind of energy information implicate order, as he refers to it, you get uh, the matter plane. And this is just, this, you know, uh, atoms and, and molecules, that sort of a thing. And then eventually through that complexification process, you get the emergence of life out of matter. Uh, and so you get single-celled organisms onto multicellular organisms, and that kind of encompasses that up to plants um, and fungi, that sort of a thing. At a certain point, you see out of certain living systems the emergence of a whole new plane of complexity called the mind-animal plane. And this is a key aspect of his contribution, because here's where we really start to see the emergence of psychology in the sense of minded behavior in nature. If you have a complex nervous system and you're mobily uh, navigating your environment, seeking food and that sort of a thing, then you're an animal, and that has different kind of behavioral properties than plants do or that rocks do. And then lastly, most recently, uh, certainly important for us, uh, you get out of a subset of minded animals, human persons. And this occurs uh, with the development of language and marks a kind of new evolutionary plane of emergence. And, uh, and he accounts for these different planes, I think, in a very important way by identifying them as novel information processing systems. So the emergence of life comes from genetic information processing. The emergence of mind comes from neuronal information processing. And the emergence of culture uh, comes through symbolic or linguistic information processing. So you get this wonderful sort of big history approach. You get all the kind of layers of complexity as they've emerged throughout cosmic evolution. And then you get a way of tracking our different kinds of knowledge relative to these different ontic planes. So physics, you know, fundamental physics does a great job with the matter plane, biology uh, with, uh, with the life plane. But then psychology is really addressing both animal psychology, kind of Skinnerian rats and things like that, but also human psychology. So you've got to be able to kind of divide those. And so I found this to be really the, the best uh, map that I'm aware of for mapping cosmic complexification and for explaining why we see these new emergent levels. And ultimately, uh, I think a key insight of recognizing that these different levels emerge because of novel information processing systems, which plugs directly into what we might mean by meaningful information and what is processing what kind of meaningful information at these different scales. Yeah, I'll add one extension to that from my perspective. Uh, I think the most important work he did for the work that I do, which is in the area of scientific study of consciousness, was, and you missed the, for my mind, the critical level. He talks about three levels of mind, mind one, mind two, and mind three. Mind one is nervous systems, but nothing like consciousness. You know, think of like a C. elegans, 304 neurons. It can learn a lot. It navigates the world. It eats. It reproduces. It, it's been around for a long time, uh, but it has no phenomenology. It would seem exceedingly unlikely unless you're an IIT religionist. And then the mind two is phenomenological subjective experience. Uh, and uh, in my world, we think that that came into being at least at the level of the amphibians, uh, and, and basically we have consciousness of some form, phenomenology, what it feels like to be. It's an actual uh, natural trick. Ma Nature's actually doing something very clever to allow her to have relevance realization in real time on a computational budget that she can afford. Mm. Uh, at least that's my argument for why we've had uh, consciousness continuously for at least 250 million years, though it is also thought that uh, something like consciousness also evolved totally independently in the large cephalopods, the big squids and octopi, uh, but it would be extremely alien to say at least with the same thing. So that's mine too. And that includes all animals from, let's say, 
a toad up to a chimpanzee, something like that. Uh, and they all have some form of subjective experience. And the subjective experiences are each different, very radically different. It's the famous paper, Thomas Nagel, What's mm -hmm. It Like to Be a Bat? If you ever want to read just one scientific paper for shits and grins, read this one. And he tries to get you into the mindset of, okay, what if you're a being that uses echolocation to do most of your sense perception, what the hell does that mean? You know, what does a shapely female bat look like to a dude bat who's assessing them via echolocation? It's hard to even imagine. That's his point. And so there's there. And then mind three is where somewhere along the line, we're not quite sure when, this thing called language emerged and probably a proto-language first. Uh, and that then opens up a whole new plane of existence and a whole new set of affordances about what animals with nervous systems and brains and subjectivity can do. Uh, so anyway, sorry, that's just an extension that I find very important into his theory. No, it's, theory. yeah, it's, it's crucial. And, um, yeah, I, I figured I only had five to seven minutes and trying to give all of you talk in that, uh, amount of time would, would not be able to capture everything. It's actually a very comprehensive system. I tend to focus primarily on the, the tree of knowledge and what he calls the periodic table of behavior. And I talk about both of these things at some length in this rather short book, but there's actually a lot more to his system as well. And in fact, if people are interested, the Institute that I run published his book on the topic. Uh, if you wanted to get a kind of a summary primer to you talk, uh, he just put out you talk the theory of of knowledge and um, and that kind of offers a, a nice overview of that. But my my book uh, actually is really uh, deeply engaged with his architecture that he's using here and uh, is its own way a kind of even shorter summary of the basic kind of uh, thresholds and, and things that he's using there. So um, I really lean very heavily on his big history map in order to, uh, well, yeah, map uh, the evolution of meaning, particularly as a kind of uh, information that's being processed by different kinds of entities up the complexity stack. Yeah, and as a uh, heads up, uh, we're having Greg on the show to talk about his new book sometime in November, as I recall. Yeah, lovely. So, uh, you know, that'll be fun. Now, as I said, we, we did do three episodes on his big fat book. Uh, and so this will be probably a more popular version. I haven't looked at the thing yet. but I, uh, I have to say, I listened to each of those episodes and they were brilliant. They were wonderful. Uh, and if people aren't going to go buy that book that he wrote because it is a, an academic work uh, that, you know, has the academic publishing price to it, then definitely check out those three episodes because you guys did a great job unpacking uh, that very full volume he wrote. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, we actually, I actually approached the publisher and asked them if they would consider <laughs> providing a discount on the a big discount, like down to thirty dollars on the paperback version for a limited period of time, or even with a code word. And they said no. And so, <laughs> oh, they offered a fifteen percent discount. I go, huh. yeah, offer a hundred and forty nine dollar book, kiss my ass. <laughs> right. There's, you know, no hardly anybody in my audience could spend one hundred forty nine dollars for minus fifteen percent for a book, but. The new book's nineteen ninety nine, so a lot more uh, accessible for most folks. Yeah, that'd be a lot more fun. So let's now move on to where uh, it really gets interesting. We start talking about learning, you know, mm. you know, and learning can happen in all kinds of interesting ways. So start talking about what when you mean when you say learning and how those relate to entities and fields. Yeah. So uh, one of the moves I'm trying to make here, right, is if we can talk about meaning as a kind of information, a specific kind of information uh, in the manner that we've been discussing, then, uh, well, what does it look like to acquire said information, to process said information, to integrate said information? And again, to the degree that meaningful information is adaptive information, we're also just talking about uh, evolutionary processes, essentially. And so here, you know, we talked a lot about Greg's work, we could also talk a lot about Bobby Azarian's work, uh, who I also, I would say, draw equally as heavily from in terms of the uh, underlaboring of the ideas to kind of, you know, get this whole ship off the ground to mix metaphors. <laughs> because uh, Bobby's notion that he uh, advances in his book, The Romance of Reality, is that you can understand evolution itself as a learning process. Um, and that this is a learning process that has unfolded across different emergent planes of complexity. So I kind of synthesized the work of Greg and Bobby, and I identify those information processing systems that Greg is identifying in his tree of knowledge system as new kinds of, well, knowledge that we can acquire about reality, that entities acquire about reality. Uh, that's new kinds of information that can be processed. That's new kinds of meaningful information that can be processed. And, uh, and so you just kind of really apply that 
that basic framework of learning to that architecture. And you get what I'm talking about in this book, which is that to really understand what's going on in evolution, you're seeing the complexification of, of entities relative to their environments through a process of basically encoding, uh, in a sense, that information about their environment in a manner that allows them to be more adaptive and to continue and to thrive and flourish. So enhancing its viability. So what evolution is, is a learning process, but it's the learning of specifically meaningful information. Again, you could learn, you could memorize all those numbers in that random email I sent you of all those of numbers, right? But that's not a good use of your time. Uh, it is not, you would not have learned a great deal and, uh, and actually spending time and energy doing so would be maladaptive. And so you can start to see all the deep ways that all of these ideas really kind of come together. And learning is a broad category that itself then complexifies kind of ways that you and I learn as human beings can lean on symbolic information processing, cognitive information processing, genetic information processing. But this is then a very rich and sophisticated notion of what learning can be. But, you know, that deer in the field at uh, twilight also is learning absent, you know, symbolic information processing, but it's learning cognitively. It's learning neuronally. It's uh, having experiences and uh, adjusting its behavior based on those. But then you go deeper down the complexity stack just to the level of, of life, and you see that there's a genetic learning process underway by means of which organisms evolve by adapting to new information constraints in their environment. And so even just biological evolution, again, can be seen as a kind of learning process. I make a kind of bold assertion that if this is all true, and there's some continuity linking these processes, however much they may sort of diminish in complexity as you go down the stack, then there's some kind of learning quote unquote, that's also happening at a purely material structural level. So what I've basically done here is I've taken Greg Enriquez's matter, life, mind, culture, planes of complexity, appreciated that there's information processing that distinguishes them all, appreciating that there's different entity field relationships that, uh, that characterize them all, and then basically acknowledging that there's different kinds of learning that is going to take place at those different levels. And there's going to be then different kinds of meaningful learning or the, the learning of meaningful knowledge at all those levels. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do by framing all of this evolutionary complexification process as a learning process that's ultimately one of learning meaning and value. Cool. Uh, talking about Bobby Azarian, we had him on an EP 159 where he talks about uh, on the romance of reality. That was a fun episode. We argued a fair bit, but uh, <laughs> it was enjoyable. Uh, and uh, to the idea of physical structures learning, this is more metaphorical than exact. Uh, Stuart Brand, my friend Stuart Brand's book, How Buildings Learn, is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he makes the point that, of course, the buildings don't change themselves, but people change the buildings based on their use cases. Mm. And so in some sense, metaphorical more than perhaps exact, uh, buildings over time learn by being adjusted uh, and become a better, more fitted to the use of the current person. Now, the other thing I'd love to get you to chat a little bit about, uh, as we talk about adaptive, we talk about good for, et cetera, fairly often we're wrong about what we learn or it's not adaptive. An example I, I would like to sort of just pick at because it's simple. So imagine a kid bitten by a dog at age seven and basically builds in a overlearned lesson of fear of dogs for life and makes him miserable when he's walking down the street. And of course, that's a simple case, but there's many, many other cases where learning or what's or is non-adaptive or where even things that were adaptive aren't adaptive uh, in new environments. So let's, let's tease that apart just a little bit. Yeah. So this is interesting, actually. And here's where some of these distinctions can start to be really informative, right? So uh, you're talking about a human child uh, who was bit by a dog and then develops a certain potentially maladaptive uh, learned behavior in response to that. Now, what's interesting in that context is that as a human child, presuming they're, you know, are, have access to linguistic communication capacity, they are then able to voice 
what their experience was, uh, what they feel like they know about dogs and about uh, how to behave around them to other people. Uh, we live in intersubjective communicative context at the plane of culture, and we use language to do just that. And so what's interesting about a child then is uh, they're able to use language to express and communicate what they've quote unquote learned, but they're also probably going to get some pushback from other linguistically endowed human beings who might say things like, well, no, I think you're probably overreacting or not all dogs are like that, or you need to have uh, different kinds of experiences to properly generalize this sort of a thing. And so again, to bring up Greg's work around notions of justification, uh, which is what language ostensibly uh, is, I guess, for, you could say, in some senses, right? That we're able to learn together through shared justifications and shared meaning making. Then that child is able to make better sense and do better sense making because they're uh, embedded in a whole collective of other justifying human persons and might even say, for example, go to therapy and then do CBT or something and then be able to unpack those justifications and dot, dot, dot. Now, I bring all that up because if you compare that to, say, like a chimpanzee or, or uh, some uh, animal, a uh, very advanced mammal on, on the uh, plane of, of mind, just kind of at the animal level, if you lack communication at the symbolic register, then you aren't able to communicate and therefore justify and put into words in a manner that can be informationally conveyed to your conspecifics. And so uh, that individual experience stays an individual experience. That maladaptive pattern that that animal adopts as a response to their stimulus that occurred it will stay basically that for the rest of their life, probably, because there's no way to adjudicate it, to open it up to intersubjective verification and analysis and accounting. And so this is an interesting way that meanings can transform in a sense for how the dynamics of meanings can shift as you move up the complexity stack. And what I'm getting at ultimately here is that as complexification unfolds and you get these emergent planes of information processing, different kinds of learning can occur. So what is available to the human child because they have language is not available to the uh, individual animal. And when we have something like language, we are in the capacity to learn from other people and their experiences as you know animals as well. So I guess what I'm getting at ultimately is that Learning continues, but it also takes different shapes uh, across the complexity stack, uh, owing to the different kinds of information that we're processing for meaning. Yeah, that's uh, very important, and I'm sure you'll develop that further as you move into the uh, the cultural side, the sociological side, and even the T word, right? Uh, so that, I'm looking forward to reading that and the things that come after. And while I was reading that section, I had this following weird thought, which was historically, uh, Darwinian evolution pruned maladaptive learning but perhaps in our time where nobody fucking dies uh, for their bad decisions, that may be why the world seems to be full of so much bogus learning. What do you think of that Ruddian conjecture? Yeah, I think that it's interesting how, and this goes back to your earlier question um, about, you know, what's the scale that we're applying? And we talked a little bit then about really appreciating all the new additions and layers that show up at as you move into higher levels of complexity. Because uh, what I'd be getting at with all this is that as an individual, as individuals, we could say, our well-being is sort of impinged upon and supported by the collective, right? And so there are evolutionary pressures that might have exerted themselves on individuals in certain ways that now collectively we might have, you know, altered the, the calculus for. But those will have second order, third order, you know, kinds of uh, new evolutionary pressures at different levels, right? If a society starts to go off the rails because some development in culture has allowed certain things to take place that are, yeah, causing maybe maladaptive collective uh, patterns of behavior to emerge, then that's still going to be an evolutionary pressure, but it's one that's going to affect the well-being and the integrity and the viability of the entire collective social structure, right? Yeah, this is so, this frame question again, yeah, right? If you look right. at, the, look at uh, you know, some some arbitrary society unnamed where all the teenagers are doing TikTok instead of sex, then uh, that society is likely to die out. Yeah, well, you know, and the individual, uh, you know, analyses of what we might be registering as pathological, uh, you know, or maladaptive learned behavior could vary, but the basic idea still holds, which is that, well... 
added to that though is there are also unexpected and emergent and rather complex forms of causation involved here. So uh, we don't necessarily know either what's maladaptive until after the case. It could be that some change in our environment occurs and maybe it turns out that all those TikTokers were just perfectly placed to uh, you know exploit that new niche. I, I kind of doubt that, but I'm saying that, yeah, there are dynamics. Yeah, you're right. And it's very important to always keep in mind, Darwinianism is the classic post hoc explanation for something, right? Uh, you know, yes, it happened. That's all it can say, really, right? Uh, it can't really tell you what's adaptive right now, other than, well, you know, Shakerism is probably not going to reproduce well, very well. Yeah, but this is interesting, though, and I do think it, it raises some really important meta questions about evolution, because I have a quote of Deacon's in the book where he, he gets at some version of this, which is that, yeah, uh, natural selection is sort of a, an after the fact assessment of what is adaptive and therefore what kind of counts as, you know, learned information being passed through that selection filter. But even though the kind of broad evolutionary Darwinian process is itself, as he says, not normative in nature, it does create normative consequences or normative dynamics for individuals in context or for collectives in context. So, what I'm interested in exploring is the various ways that I do think we can even see some deep normative aspects to the evolutionary process on a, as a whole that I think are warranted conclusions. Like, for example, here would be one. I don't know what you would make of this, but is it normatively the case that like uh, having more information, let's say more meaningful information is better, right? In the sense that we've been talking about it. There would seem to be, and we're talking very loosely here and, and whatnot, but it would seem to be that th that is the case, that if you have more uh, meaningful information, then inherently that's going to produce a an advantage to your evolutionary sort of situation and thus would account for the sorts of changes that we have seen over and over again occur throughout cosmic complexification, right? Like complexity itself on the whole seems to be a direction to evolution on the whole, obviously, some things don't have the need to complexify, but it does seem that the evolutionary process and its dynamics generates a situation in which complexification uh, occurs. And I do also, mostly in the end notes, talk a little bit about this, drawing on the work of, say, Adrian Behan and uh, talked of uh, constructal theory and this sort of thing, because it's ultimately getting at what's the most efficient use of energy dynamics for uh, the, you know, basically... Uh, you know, the dissipative uh, adaptation and the dissipative uh, structures that we were talking about earlier, what, you know, what generates the most optimal flows of energy moving through systems? And it seems like it's uh, complexifying configurations that do that. And so there does seem to be a kind of quote unquote normative aspect. What do you make of that uh, framing? Yeah, I think there, this is, of course, one of the big questions about complexity. Is there something about the nature of the universe that favors increased complexity over time. And my take on that is sort of, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so for instance, as we sit here near the sun uh, with the far from equilibrium flux of solar energy driving a biosphere, it's sufficiently strong far from equilibrium flux, and particularly the invention of, of uh, photosynthesis somewhere along the line way by good luck and good timing. You know, I suspect a lot of life never develops photosynthesis. It was uh, chemical eating only. When it ran out of chemicals, that was it. Hmm. Uh, ours invented photosynthesis. Very weird that it happened, uh, probably. And that's allowed our life to have this far from equilibrium Prigozhin flux, and our complexity will continue to increase. But one of these days, sun's going to go super giant, going to roast the earth, right? And we could just be entirely wiped out, or we could be wiped out by an asteroid or lots of things that could wipe us out, uh, in which case the complexity that we have built, uh, say, advanced, let's say, mammals. Mammals could get wiped out. And uh, uh, whether that level of complexity would ever be found again by ma nature is entirely unclear. Uh, if there was an event sufficiently bad, say a snowball Earth, where this happened before, where the Earth froze solid except for a small belt at the equator, everything on the surface died. The only thing that existed was uh, relatively simple organisms in the ocean. And when you replayed that tape, would we get this level of complexity? I don't know. Uh, but we might. We'd, we'd get some ramifying complexity, but what level of contingencies 
uh, were necessary to produce yeah. our level of complexity. Uh, I'm just not 100% sure. Well, and I don't think we'll ever know for sure, but it's we don't necessarily have to do the comp the calculations of you know how much is contingent, how much is necessary, these sorts of things. There seems to be some sort of dialectical dance between chance accident and also just uh, kind of law-like progression to the unfolding of certain kinds of, uh, you know, behavioral complexification patterns. I mean, you brought up earlier the potential uh, co uh, independent emergence of consciousness in cephalopods, right? And those instances of convergent evolution are always very suggestive to me. You know, the, the crabification uh, process is another one sort of, right? Uh, I forget what the technical term is. Carcinization or something like that? Um, where there do seem to be these functional aspects uh, that keep reemerging uh, because of their adaptability, because of the ways that they're able to, you know, most effectively and efficiently allow an organism in context to, you know, extract the energy it needs from its environment and to um, make to gather meaningful knowledge. You could say in all these ways, and um, I find I find those things really compelling and interesting, and probably move me into the direction of, you know, an exploration of these ideas, which. I'm trying to present in the most compelling way uh, possible or as the, the most convincing way possible because this to me does start to lean into where a lot of the conversation at the end of the book heads to and kind of concludes with before the next book will start, which is the, the question of the sacred, which uh, I'm, we'll probably touch on in a second. But this is an interesting way of thinking about this because if there are these deep patterns that are sort of shoring themselves up through time, getting amplified through the complexification process, that we experience as not just meaningful, but actually kind of the source of meaning itself, because this is, these are the deep processes through which meaning emerges and develops, then, yeah, I feel like there's something that we could almost say is sacred about uh, complexification and, uh, and that there's a kind of meaning in it in that sense, which I think we can say without recourse to woo, but just merely based on the kind of complexification narratives that we're talking about. Yeah, good, a great example from the evolution of life is that the eye, or something like the eye, has evolved independently something like 18 times. Mm. So, so there is an attractor, at least a co-evolutionary attractor, uh, when other people can see, you better be able to see, or you're going to be in trouble, you're going to be outcompeted. So it's probably partially co-evolutionary. Mm. So there's an attractor for vision. There's no doubt about that, at least in the context of our biochemical homeostasis negentropic thing that we call life. Uh, and so within that boundary, for sure, there's a driver. And co-evolution is a huge driver. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we get that principally from life. Uh, one, one final thing before I move on is uh, the, the, the amount of information. I'm going to say that probably over the long arc of history, being able to process more information is positive, right? Yeah. You, it, you inform, you produce a form uh, that more effectively harvests uh, far from equilibrium energy to allow yourself to persist and to grow exponentially. Yeah. However, humans, I believe, are part of the reason we're suffering from uh, nuttiness is we can only, we should only be processing X amount of information per unit of time. And for a person who's got their notifications turned on their phone, don't do that, people. Spend two hours a day on TikTok, don't do that, people. They are receiving far more messages than we were designed for. And you know, people always talk about disinformation, misinformation, malinformation. Well, I think those do have some impact, but a supposition, unproven, but I'm looking for the evidence that it's the absolute number of inbound informational interrupts that you get above some number, and that number probably varies by person, uh, then you are pushed into some form of a less adaptive state. Yeah. No, I think I, I, I would largely agree with all of that. I, I think even just though what you said a second ago is really telling, and I would also very much agree with that you were suggesting that there is this overall directionality towards greater information throughout cosmic complexification or the, the, the generation of, and I, you could say then the processing of uh, more information. But isn't that just a different way of saying that there is a universal learning process underway that's uh, unfolding across all these different emergent levels of complexity, which I don't know how metaphorical it then is to say something like 
All right. Like the question would be: At what point do, does what I'm about to say be move from you know uh, sciency based to outright woo? If we go from the universe is generating more information, the universe is generating more meaningful information, the universe is learning more meaningful information, the universe is learning more information, meaningful information about itself, the universe is generating more meaning and value. Uh, in terms of a process that's leading towards entities that can understand themselves as part of, you know, th these sorts of things, I think, start to lead us into ways of understanding this process that uh, maybe start drifting into the speculative and maybe even theological register. But that's the exciting stuff about this work for me is that some of these deep, uh, even mystical questions uh, start to bump up pretty closely to some of these complexity questions and information processing questions at a cosmic scale. Yeah, very cool. Though I will, I will caution the following, which is the uh, learning history of the universe was pretty damn shallow for a very long time. Uh, the most significant thing that was learned by the universe was probably the star, right? Mm. Um, uh, I'm, well, next time I talk to Greg, I'm going to ping him on that a little bit. You left a star out. That's, <laughs> it's probably uh, you know as, almost as important as life. Uh, but but the star uh, got going within less than a billion years from the start of the universe. And stars are really interesting. You know, they're the essentially gravity and matter interact to produce all kinds of different stars. And there's many different kinds of stars. They each have their own hmm. trajectory and how they evolve. Uh, and then there's generations of stars when stars outgas in the later stages of their, their larger stars, even including ones like the sun, they're not going to go supernova, but it's going to go into a super giant stage where it throws material out. Those materials have concentrated over time. And in, uh, the astrophysicists are quite certain that the sun is at least a third generation star and perhaps a fourth generation star. And so its raw material was enriched by yeah. elements greater than helium and hydrogen. And indeed, our planet would not even existed if we had just formed a hydrogen helium cloud such as existed for the first sets of stars. So yeah. there's an evolution of elemental generations, but we only had four, ge three generations probably in 12 billion years. So I'm moving fucking slow. Uh, but life is qualitatively different. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and the, this weird ass thing, how in the world did we evolve the complicated machinery for DNA replication? Uh, is to my mind just a huge question mark. We, you know, I've done recently a show on the Fermi paradox, mm -hmm. and we go into all these very interesting. Is, is the great filter behind us or ahead of us? Right. Yeah. Uh, if if we don't see anybody. Well, I, I did briefly also want to touch on the second thing you brought up there too, which is this information overload notion. And I think that there is a lot of truth to that as well. But I also think we shouldn't overread that either, right? In the same way we were talking about maladaptive behavior before, that can take generations to, to parse out, you know? And there are still those evolutionary pressures unfolding at the social and collective level that will take effect. And uh, so it's not like evolution ends or, or even that it just leads to collapse of society per se, is that we're just at the beginning of a process and we don't know what that looks like in a number of generations, which hopefully we'll see if we can get there. But, uh, but there is that continual filtration process and the adaption process and the learning process underway that what to us might be total information overload, you know, hypothetically to people 500 years from now, again, if we're around, might just seem like, oh, a, a TV commercial, <laughs> you know, like, uh, so I'm open to that as well. Yeah, and I, my regular listeners know that I constantly rant. There's a trillion dollar opportunity out there. Uh, and I see how you'd even do it. And if I was 45 and not 70, I'd probably go do it, uh, which is to build personal information agents mm. that serve as membranes that mediate the messages that come in mm. and get approximately the messages we should have and approximately at the rate we can actually absorb. Well, uh, that's that's fascinating. But it's in, in ver versions of that we already do to some degree. But it's also interesting because that could also be itself very maladaptive unless it's in an equilibrium finding context where it's able to know how much information to let in and, and, and filter, right? Because we need, through the processes of justification and linguistic meaning sharing, we need to be bumping up against other people's information. Yeah. And so that's- I always warn that there has to be a serendipity filter in yeah. there, right? Uh, on the other hand, you also have to understand who controls that membrane. If it's <laughs> cheese China, it is not gonna turn out well, right? Or if it's uh, other well-known, uh, you know, maladaptive adjusted politicians, it's not going to turn out well. I would trust cheese China with my life. I don't know. But yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't, don't think so. Right? <laughs> the, uh, all right, let's move on here. We're, we're having so much fun here, but uh, we want to get a little bit further into this. Yeah. 
one, one of the, the ideas that I've stumbled across over the last few years that has been most transformational in my own thinking is John Verveke's concept of relevance realization. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, of course, have had John Verveke on the show numerous times, probably most well-known. This is scary. These five episodes, which are dense, hard shit, all score in the top 17 of my all-time listenerships. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, Verveke, EP 143 to 147, where we spend 10 hours condensing his 50 hours of awakening from the meaning crisis to 10. So uh, people want to learn more about relevance realization and unbelievable huge amount of other stuff. Go listen to those five episodes. you got 10 hours. Uh, but uh, why don't you explain to the audience what relevance realization is and why it's so core to, uh, to the, what your thinking is. Sure. I, I guess I'll also say that this book that I've written is kind of a, you know, summarized who's who on who's been on uh, the Jim Rutt show as well, because not just Greg and Bobby, but John Verveke is also in here as well. And I think uh, fulfills, he kind of fills a, a particular place in this conversation where I guess, well, let me back up and talk about relevance realization first and then kind of connect it with what else I'm getting into here. But the challenge is he tends to have framed where this uh, issue came from uh, to articulate relevance realization is, you know, goes back to the frame problem, which is in just kind of artificial intelligence context. Uh, how do you know what is actually information you can attend to, should attend to, and, and how do you not? And I relate this again back to the Shannon thing where there's a hypothetically infinite amount of just quote unquote information out there. We could spend all day reading all the random numbers in the world that we could potentially read. But how do we know what's re relevant information? And uh, it was very difficult to be able to kind of uh, offer a sort of formalized account of this idea. So essentially, this, that's kind of the, the crux of the problem. And uh, my understanding of John's work is largely tackling this through the lens of applying certain kinds of one predictive processing uh, models, but also certain kinds of opponent processes as dynamics that can help explain how we effectively do this. And so he talks about different forms of sort of trade-off relationships that the, that the mind uses to find equilibrium, that, that sweet spot between attending to different kinds of extremes that could be drawing our attention in different directions, right? So do we, pri uh, do we pay attention to the most general aspects of something or do we pay attention to its most particular uh, qualities, right? Do we look at the forest or the trees? Uh, well, adaptive behavior seems to take both into account and find that sort of dynamic equilibrium between them that's able to optimally home in on uh, what is, you know, uh, most relevant in a particular context and doing that continually through an adjusting uh, of differentiation and integration and assimilation and accommodation. So, yeah, uh, through these kinds of dynamic processes that the brain uses, we are always sort of transjectively attending to the relevance of our situation and ultimately looking for affordances that allow us to <laughs> increase our viability and flourishing. So his work really... I fit very neatly into sort of the cognitive learning uh, part of the architecture of this argument, right? If there's a universal learning process underway, what John is talking about with relevance realization really seems to refer specifically to what animals with complex active bodies and nervous systems are doing using their complex neuronal infrastructure to process information for meaning. And so he kind of fits right in there uh, to, to be able to talk about that. That would be how I would, in a very quick way, sort of situate uh, his work into this. Yeah, I'd add a very simple quantitative component to it as well, which I've run by him and he doesn't disagree with at least, uh, which is uh, our perceptions are bringing in millions of bits per second. Uh, our eyes, our ears, our skin. Uh, there's a very large amount of uh, perceptual information coming in, yet our conscious cognition, where a lot of our learning, not all of it, but a large amount of our learning, particularly our symbolic learning occurs, uh, only updates at the rate of about 50 bits per second. Mm. So there is a uh, vast winnowing that has to occur between the millions to the 50. And then further, and this is very close to the Ruddian theory of conscious cognition, those uh, bits and our memories together uh, form the cursor of attention. Mm -hmm. Who we really are is what I, we only keep only one object approximately in mind for anywhere from 250 milliseconds to maybe three seconds. And as we hop from object to object, and keep in mind the object can be an internal word, right? Mm -hmm. This is the internal monologue. As we hop from thing to thing to thing, 
that is who we are, actually. We are, with our cursor of consciousness is to a very substantial degree who we are. And relevance realization is one, pruning the millions to 50. And then the second of those, let's call them 25 or 50 objects in your conscious frame, choosing the one to focus the spotlight on of attention to, and then the next one and the next one and the next one. And if that's well-tuned, you are well-fitted mm -hmm. uh, between your entity and your field. Yep. If that is maladapted, let's you say the classic neurotic who goes down, renum, rem, what the hell they call it? Like morbid remuneration or something. Yeah. Anyway, if your, your head is thinking about, oh my God, the girl turned me down. Oh the God, the girl turned me down. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Those are actually attentional cursors mm. moving in a very non-adaptive fashion, right? Yeah. Uh, if on the other hand, your cursor is going, hmm, I see some sign of a deer. Hmm, <laughs> let me track that motherfucker. Oh, there he is. Boom, right? If that's how your cursor of consciousness goes, that's highly adaptive. Yeah. And uh, I, I find those two aspects, the pruning of the flood of information and the deciding on what to pay attention to in sort of a second by second time click as both being of the essence. And if it's maltuned or maladjusted, uh, you are suboptimal in as an entity in your field. Yeah, no, that that's makes all sense to you. definitely. That's all well said. And this also is a great way of bringing back in, you know, mind one, two and three, right? Because there so much of that processing is happening unconsciously, right? And it's just that little additional stuff that is coming up into conscious awareness that we're able to put our attention on things. But that's because I don't have to pay attention to my heart beating or my gallbladder doing whatever it does and that sort of thing. And also all sorts of information processing, even from my environment that's coming in and uh, being in a sense processed, but not consciously so. And so you just get this sort of a lot of mind one sort of doing that work for you so that mind two can be that attentional filter. And again, uh, the only thing I would add to that, which I totally agree with, is just that, you know, we tend to to make the point, talk about adaption or adaptation uh, using metaphors of sort of getting food and, you know, increasing our survivability rate or something, right? But like one of the core points I want to get across in this book as well is that viability at the level of human being uh, isn't just that kind of genetic level survival. It's also how am I not just adaptive relative to the energy for the food that it's going to keep me alive, but how am I, uh, how's my attentional filter paying the right kind of attention to the social dynamics that are around me, right? How do I pay enough attention to the fact that that girl turned me down, but then don't allow that to become this sort of neurotic loop that leads to reciprocal narrowing and then doesn't actually aid my flourishing, right? Because I do need to pay attention to that, but I need to pay the right kind of attention to it. And that's all part of the meaning making that we do. And so, uh, I just wanted to throw that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And this is the thing I've gotten from John uh, is that it's so important that that be tuned correctly, mm -hmm. right? And in, se in some sense, uh, trying to improve as a person above all else is tuning your relevance realization yeah. to who you are, what your natural talents are, right? If I'm going to tune my relevance re recommendation to being an NBA basketball player, it's not going to work too well. Uh, being an old fat man, that's not going to not going to work too well. Uh, but if I want to tune my relevance realization to picking out, uh, you know, deer from my deer stand, uh, then yeah, that'll pay off, you know, very handsomely. So you sort of have to understand your field and understand who you are as an entity and then tune your relevance realization yeah. to do as good a job, which may not be perfect, it won't be perfect, we guarantee, but it's, uh, you know, as well as you can do in processing the yeah. information the world gives you and then triggering the, the affordances that you have so as to accomplish whatever your mission is. And, and John talks about that as wisdom, which I think is right uh, spot on. And that is sort of very much what I'm getting at here as well with when we do start talking about the sacred and how this does eventually enter into uh, meaning systems and uh, uh, belief systems, all this stuff of uh, kind of the traditionally religious, philosophical, existential and wisdom oriented kinds of uh, information that we're processing. That's all meaningful information. And it's ultimately about our viability and our flourishing in our context. And it, interestingly, it does relate back to that question you, or the thing we were just talking about a second ago in terms of information overload, right? It's maladaptive to have your notifications always sucking your attentional filter away, right? It's wise, um, like wisdom is always that process of honing your own behavioral responses to the various stimuli that you're taking in towards uh, your and the collective flourishing, which...
I, I keep returning to again because uh, I can't stress enough how by the time you reach the human level, because of language, we are socially embedded uh, creatures, and that's a huge part of our, our context. So, you know, our meaning is collective in that nature as well. Yeah, that's uh, you know very true, very well said. Though I must say, wisdom is one of those other words that gives me gas. Because <laughs> uh, in, in the sense, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday. They're trying to sell me wisdom. Blah, blah, blah. And I go, uh, I said, well, if you take wisdom as the ability to make correct decisions, I'm all for wisdom. But the way you're using it, dude, it's just some woo bullshit, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a little skeptical of the W word, but the concept as you described it, Absolutely. And John Verveke, when he uses wisdom, he means it in exactly yeah. this way. Yeah. I probed him very deeply on it. There's not a woo bone in John's body, <laughs> even though some people think there are. You know, uh, it's easy. you can interpret John in a wooish fashion. But let me tell you, from mm. after many hours of conversation, he's sound. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to the last topic here we're going to talk about, which is... Uh, uh, I'm kind of got to do two things. We have to do the first one probably a little faster than I would have liked, and which is the kind of the arc of the complexification of meaning into the social, and then I want to spend a moderate amount of time on the concept of the sacred. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And those dovetail pretty well, actually. So thanks, because um, yeah, I wanted this part to come across. It is very important. So even though there, as I've said, there is this kind of deep process. Uh, which has a structure to it, it is also discontinuous in the way that it manifests as things complexify. So as learning unfolds, as uh, the universe complexifies and you get these emergent levels, matter, life, mind, and culture, then different kinds of meaningful information is processed through those information processing entities at those different levels. And so, yeah, briefly stated, learning, meaning, value, these are very loose semantic, you know, usages for what's going to happen at the deep material, structural, or quantum level, right? There's interesting work that can be done to show that quantum uh, decoherence, you know, can be framed as a, a kind of predictive processing and this and that. And I mentioned some of that work in the book. And in that sense, could fall into this general pattern that we're talking about, but it really, this process itself looks more and more like what we mean by learning and meaning and value as you go up the complexity stack, because, well, those are all ideas that we as humans developed. And so we can see their continuity lower down, but it's not until they get to our level that they reach the level that they do. So yeah, at the level of sort of matter and structure, it's about kind of persistence. You know, meaning is just, uh, it's, it's unconscious. It is purely that transjective relationship of a particular thing in context that has meaningful information by warrant of the fact that it needs to resist entropy if it is going to continue as an entity. And only with sort of life do you see then meaning take on uh, a broader uh, significance as meaningful information becomes the basis by means of which uh, organisms evolve. And so the natural selection process is a collective learning process. You know, we might still put learning in quotation marks, but, you know, that's up, up for folks to determine. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm for not putting it in quotation okay, marks. Okay, great. I, I think you made the argument extremely well, and other people have too, but you did it really well, that absolutely evolution is learning. Great. So, yeah, we can look at it uh, through that lens, but I think the thing that I would emphasize is that it's a collective process, that what is learning uh, isn't the individual, you know, bacterium per se. It is the, the genome of a particular species that is getting updated by means of natural selection, and that that is a way that we can map sort of the information there that's being processed to the environment in a way that it is about the environment. And Terrence Deacon makes that point very eloquently. So that with life, you do see learning and you see the aboutness of information. So it's semantic information about the environment, but it's being processed phylogenetically by the entire species. By the time you get to cognitive learning and you've got complex animal bodies, now you've got the possibility for ontogenetic learning, which is the individual organism is itself processing information based on the environment through the nervous system and then adjusting its behavior accordingly. So, yeah, yeah. let me give you a quick little example from my white-tailed deer here. Yeah. The way uh, young deer learn what to eat is they eat the same thing as their mother and they copy her mimesis essentially. Mm -hmm. And then some small percentage of the ones are a little radical. They're the ornery teenagers. They'll go try something else. Some of them will die and some of them will discover a new food source. Yep. So uh, that's the ontogenetic uh, 
learning in a, just a hardcore material sense because it obviously impacts your ability to survive. If your diet is too narrow during a time of drought, you will die. If it's too rich, you won't be eating the right optimal stuff. Uh, so it's a tuning again, like relevance yeah. realization. Well, and that's a good way also to illustrate that by the time you get to cognitive learning, it's not like genetic learning has gone away. It's just been supplemented actually by a new information processing system. So in that case, actually, I would actually call that genetic learning because what's actually happening there is then the genome or the, the genetic information of the white-tailed deer species has gotten an update uh, based on the engagement with the environment because those d deer who died are not going to reproduce and therefore that's information about the environment that's going to be carried forward, you could say. But now another example using those white-tailed deer, you could say uh, a deer goes and tries to eat something that mom hasn't eaten and it's a prickly plant and it doesn't like it and it freaks out and it, and it stops. Now, that's a great example because that is learned behavior, but it didn't lead to the death of the organism. They were able to quickly, adaptively respond and learn not to eat that thing so that now that information has been encoded in their in their nervous system, you could say, and in their memory so that when they encounter that again, they're not going to do that. So that's adaptive behavior at the ontogenetic level that leverages neuronal complexity as an information processing system. Now, as you get more and more complex animals, you get more and more complex animal relationships and those themselves bear on the viability of the, the animal. So, for example, mama deer and, and, and baby deer. That's a social relationship, broadly conceived, that bears on the viability of the deer, right? If, if mama isn't there, then the baby deer is a lot more vulnerable and less likely to, to succeed. So there are social relationships that then get mediated through ontogenetic uh, individual learning at the animal level that leverages the kind of pain, pleasure, attraction, repulsion response of the nervous system to facilitate learning, right? So that when the, you know, the mother uh, caresses the baby deer and gives it a sense of comfort and all these things, there is an, you could very literally say, an emotional bond that takes place between those two animals and that that is also deeply important to what is valuable to the deer. And so, again, at this level, you can see emotion, you can see value, you can see meaning. And these processes continue up to, you know, like very complex social uh, interactions like apes, you know, who have whole hierarchies and these sorts of things. I mean, yeah, we see this amongst uh, more co neuronally complex entities like elephants and dolphins and whatnot, that there's a very rich emotional life and very rich social dynamics. And by the time you're seeing that sort of dynamic um, unfold, again, you can see how meaning is enmeshed in social and collective contexts so that what's valuable for that deer hinges upon what's valuable for the mother deer and vice versa, or what's valuable for the ape is hinges on what the alpha or whatever thinks in relation to the rest. So the point is that as meaning complexifies and you start getting deeper emotional connections and social bonds, you start seeing uh, a deeper enmeshment in the valuations and meanings of other entities and conspecifics. By the time you get to humans and the advent of language, then you get a real revolution in meaning making because now the individual experience of meaning can be articulated in using the information processing system of language to a conspecific in a way that keeps its informational form. And now I am able to tell you, Jim, everything I've been telling you, and we've been able to share our meanings for the past uh, bit of time. And this now is a, and this is kind of huge, I think, <laughs> for obvious reasons, but the, one of the big reasons this is so important is we are now able to learn together. We're able to think together. You can go eat, hopefully you wouldn't, you can go eat that spiky plant that the deer ate or whatever, and then you can just tell me, hey guys, don't eat that, that's, that's no fun. And we don't all have to do that. So we can all collectively start learning together and we can start sharing our meanings. And as we do this, we develop collective systems of meaning and value. And this is where you start getting into the whole uh, social sphere of meaning and value, which just to emphasize again, we've seen now is deeply emotive, socially connected, interpersonally enmeshed, and uh, has based upon earlier meanings at the animal level to add an additional layer where you're deeply interconnected in terms of all the meanings that are going on here so that it's not just a matter of, you know, hey, what's good for my viability as Brendan Dempsey? Because now my viability hinges on your viability and vice versa. And we're all kind of, quote unquote, in this together. Yeah, I've got uh, Ruddian theories, because I've Ruddian theories for everything. But uh, what evolutionary ratchets drove this? And I, I have three. Uh, one, and there's quite a bit of support for this amongst uh, anthropological linguists, 
that the a famous Dunbar number has to do with how many credit and debit re- relationships we can keep hmm. track of in a social system. Chimps have sort of a max group size of about 30, but big groups can beat little groups generally in chimp warfare, and they do engage in warfare. Uh, humans, because once we develop some form of at least proto-language and a big enough brain to do bookkeeping on our social relationships, we're able to ratchet our, our small group size to 50 and our big group size to 150. And we can beat any, any group of 30 trips, even though a chimp is a lot stronger than a mm. human, right? Uh, so that's number one. Then number two, uh, and this is kind of the gossip argument. Once you have the beginnings of language enough to be able to increase your group size, now there's coevolution within the members of the group on who can add the most value, seduce the most members of the opposite sex, lie their way to status, whatever. And so uh, as you get better and better at language, you're better and better at doing those things. And then finally, uh, we've had tools for a very, very long time, long before Homo sapiens, way back. Homo habilis was making tools several steps before uh, Homo sapiens. But it was only late in Homo sapien period that we started making multi-part tools. And I uh, cooked up this idea with a guy named Walter Fontana late one night after a bottle of whiskey, the whole <laughs> bottle. It's the way to uh, do it. <laughs> that uh, the set of skills to learn to teach multi-part tool making, because as order, but there's still some freedom. You don't have to do it in exactly the same order, but if you do it in a great crazy order, it doesn't work, uh, was the substrate necessary to develop syntax. Hmm. And then syntax took language to a whole new level. And there's a fair bit of argument that full language didn't flourish until maybe 40,000 years ago, which is suspiciously close to the same period when multi-part tools uh, Hmm. came along. Uh, Yeah. I mean, so I'm open to any number of these theories. And I think probably it's not either or, right? Collectively, these could have... That's why I have a three-part theory. (laughs) That's that's three things. Because the language leap is unbelievably huge, right? And so I don't believe like Chomsky did. Oh, yeah, by chance, a very low probability mutation occurred and we suddenly had full Chomsky and universal yeah. grammar and recursive language all at once. I go, yeah. no. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I mean, how I, I to some degree, I sidestep, and granted, it's a short book anyway, the issue of where did language come from and why and all of that. I'm, I'm very uh, open, especially to theories like Kevin Lalland, I think, has with the talk about social learning as being key to this. So I, that that yeah, Everett also hmm. he's a he basically he he's most extreme. He claims there's no machinery at all, uh, and that it's purely social learned. And he wrote a whole book on it. It's sort of okay. I like Deacon myself as somebody who's yeah. in the middle. Uh, so there's a little bit of machinery, basically the circuit for symbols, and that's all you need. And the rest can be bootstrapped socially and coevolutionarily. Yeah. The way I just well, and about one. Um, I think core aspect that I'm going to focus on for the rest of this series that's really core to the argument, which can very much align with these other theories as well, at least in terms of what got the process going. But what I really lean heavily into is that uh, once you get shared meaning justifications going on in culture through language, then you can have a co-learning process occur collectively that if to the degree that, yeah, having a better sense of what meaningful information is, is adaptive, uh, that's going to have a kind of evolutionary advantage in a way that could have runaway uh, effects, right? It, as soon as we break the solipsistic prison of just our own individual experience, and we're actually able to just develop kind of shared understandings about the world and to test those understandings with each other and say, I had this happen. Well, I had this happen and have thousands of generations of this unfolding. Then through the processes of justification alone, you get sort of Piagetian style learning. And that's kind of what the rest of the series is really going to dig into very much is using the kind of uh, inheritor of the sort of Piagetian developmental psychology tradition, uh, which is hierarchical complexity, to look at the complexification of thought through that model, through that lens, and see how culture has sort of progressively unfolded using a metric like that, and by analyzing its systems of justification according to their levels of complexity. And so core to that is this notion that, and it's in John's work as well, but more at sort of the individual animal uh, level of assimilation and accommodation. You know, we bump up against each other and we're looking for that dynamic equilibrium and I can have my own individual truth. But as soon as I have to compare that to yours and there's disagreement, we've got to kind of work this out. And if there are 10 other people who agree with you and only, you know, so these processes of sort of shared meaning making, 
uh, meaning sharing and justification sharing, um, I think themselves are sort of a, a ratcheting process that leads to more complex thought over time. And that in many ways, you can read the entire history of cultural evolution through that lens. Yep, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I, I will just uh, suggest the, the one thing that you probably have in there, but if you don't, you should, mm. which is science yeah. itself was a new form of justification that had far greater ability to self-correct yeah. in real time than any of the previous ones. And uh, that was a very important, huge, and as we just look at the effect of it, right? You know, we go from living in mud huts with no glass in 1700 to about ready to land somebody on Mars. So unfortunately, we don't have time to go into this, the implications of this even further, because uh, I did yeah. want to leave a little bit of time to talk about the sacred. Uh, now, this is a good, another one of these words I used to go, bah, sacred. <laughs> You're talking about fucking God. Fuck that. But I've developed a much more nuanced sense of the sacred, and it's actually pretty damn close to your view of it. Uh, so why don't you uh, tell us what the word sacred means to you? Sure. So the sacred is um, one way of thinking about this whole process. Uh, let's start at the level of humans, though, because I think that what we mean by that is most um, obvious. Yeah, let's mostly focus on the humans and just sure. point back very briefly yeah. that in some sense it's applicable. Yeah, prior. that's that's enough to, to say there for that. At the human level, once we get these collective systems of justification that we're using to process meaningful information together, then we are creating kind of collective representations that are more or less helpful for us in increasing our collective viability, right? So you get collective meaning, collective value, you get worldviews, you get collective justification systems. And one of the ways of thinking about the sacred in that context is what are sort of the repositories of tried and true, established, uh, successful forms of understanding the world that we can draw on as a template, as a as something to turn to in order to understand the world in a way that has proven success, right? Uh, what are the deep informing aspects uh, of our collective ways of being that have been the means of our flourishing in the past? These are collective representations and uh, modes of being. They can be beliefs, they can be ritually enshrined, they can be all sorts of things, but they are sort of tried and true aspects to our flourishing. And because of that, we give them a special reverence and a special appreciation and a special care and protection. And so we develop culturally, sociologically, a relationship to these sorts of things in a particular mode that marks them off as being particularly sacred to uh, our collective. And um, I think this is well illustrated if you just think of different kinds of social collectives and what they have deemed sacred, how different those different things can be, and yet functionally they serve a very similar role, right? In a forager society, a nomadic uh, society, for example, there might be a sacred pole that is the center around which the, the group kind of considers it, you know, Mercia Elia would say it cosmicizes the world, but this is, this is the world pole and it will have a story, a myth about an ancient ancestor who gave it and it's a sacred thing and there are taboos around it, etc. Kind of an classic anthropological treatment of, you know, the sacred. Now, what is that? That's world building. That is the construction of sacred space, which is the making of a world, which is a world sustaining a concept. It's something that has had the role of bringing people together and cohering them through a duration of time in a, in a way that has proved successful. And so it is held as sacred because of that. And, and if you want to read Durkheim through this lens, it's all kind of right there. I think he kind of reduces it too much and is a bit too extreme in some of his conclusions, but a lot of his insights are really gesturing at this. Where compare now the way that we talk about what are sacred in kind of a modern democratic state. You hear talk about all the time when people talk about, you know, January 6th, for example. Oh, they stormed, you know, the, the seat of our sacred institution or the sacred seat of democracy or what have you, right? Or any number of instances when we talk about the sacred right of voting or the sacredness of human rights and dignity and this sort of thing, right? This is a, this is, how does this relate to a poll that, you know, cohere as a tribal group, it's a very different thing, but its function is kind of deeply similar, which is without this, we couldn't continue to function and thrive as we have been doing. And so we shore this up and we enshrine it as sacred. And that's real. Like that's not just, oh, they invented some sacred bullshit. It's like, yeah, that's actually true. If we lost these things, we would cease to function. And what would happen is we'd experience entropic breakdown. The complexity that we've amassed 
through the course of, of human evolution in our social configurations is based on sort of a ratcheting sense of what the sacred is and how it needs to function in our society. And when you see moments where societies collapse, it's often directly, let's say, related to or involving a collapse of notions of what it holds to be sacred. What are its meanings? What are its values, right? Uh, arguably, we're experiencing a moment like this right now, and we talk about the meaning crisis. Well, it's a breakdown of collective meaning in a way that we can't get on the same page of what's actually meaningful, what's actually valuable. Maybe it's all a social construct, etc. So one of my notions about the sacred is is that, and I guess the quickly what I'll say in addition to that is, I think in a very cool way, you can connect this all the way back down through kind of uh, the complexity stack to deep thermodynamic principles. So I, I talk about at the end what I what I call the thermodynamic theory of the sacred, which is to say that you can imagine the sacred itself as a kind of complexifying structure that uses the substrate of human collective uh, social configurations to express itself via linguistic justification systems and requires energy to be maintained. And actually, as these collective social organizations complexify, they do require more energy to maintain them. And as the sacred complexifies, it in a sense is um, buttressing societies of increasing collective energetic consumption as well. So there's a way in which the sacred is a kind of dissipative structure that is um, complexifying. Uh, and so anyway, that's, that's a brief summary version of some of that. Believe it or not, I don't have a single <laughs> objection to that view. I think that is a very useful way to think about it. Let me put some gloss on it, uh, though. One, looking back to the whirlpool, the drain is sacred. Mm, there, sure. There, how about that? Does that work? Yeah. And now let's get back to humans. And uh, as I look at the broad arc of history, uh, people have held all kinds <laughs> of weird shit sacred, obviously, right? Think about the Aztecs, right? If we don't uh, cut the hearts out of 200 teenage boys and girls every week, the sun's not going to continue shining. And eventually it pissed off all their allies, uh, or not their allies, their neighbors, who they were going to raid to get teenagers. This guy Cortez shows up and says, let's go overthrow those motherfuckers. And so even though Cortez had like 300 guys and the Aztecs had like an army of 150,000, uh, because they pissed off all their neighbors with their sacred, uh, yeah. they got overthrown. Uh, and so... Uh, when I look at the sacred, I think of it as sort of a meta way. How do we set the sacred? Uh, it has to do with thinking about what is the proper viscosity for our mm. operating system. If we just change willy-nilly with the wind, what you talk about happens, we ju I would argue, we just dissipate, fall apart, and turn into a flat land. Nothing interesting going on. On the other hand, uh, societies easily get stuck on very rigid senses of the sacred. Uh, like I'd argue that for... And maybe these were adaptive in, that, in those circumstances, but not adaptive anymore. Uh, how long slavery, patriarchy, racism, dominance through violence were sacred, more or less, right? The warrior. I re recently reread mm -hmm. the Iliad, two mm -hmm. different translations. And these Bronze Age dudes, man, they were some <laughs> strange ass dudes, right? They were reveling in their capture and raping of people and yep. pillaging of cities. And we are great people, yep. but that's yep. what we do, right? And that, that was yep. stuff was sacred to them, the, the yep. warrior ethos. But rapidly in the last uh, 500 years and more rapidly, 300 years, uh, we have changed those senses of the sacred. We no longer think of slavery as sacred or the uh, warrior your yeah. rapist is sacred. But on the other hand, if we change too fast, we, we risk getting to flat land. But if we don't change at all, uh, we are, are going to be yeah. non-adaptive. And I suspect the stress around the sacred right now is that the co-evolutionary context of humans and culture is changing at an unbelievably rapid and escalating exponential. And we do not know at what rate to preserve mm. the sacred versus yeah. to modify it. And one could even say that the idiocy of American Team Red and Team Blue politics at the deepest level is where should mm. we turn the knob for mm. viscosity? Team Red says we want less viscosity. Uh, Team Blue says we want more viscosity. Wow. Yeah, love it. I mean, I could spend two hours just talking about these dynamics because this is what ultimately most fascinates me. And uh, I think you're exactly right. The sacred evolves, which is what this whole book series is going to be about exploring by identifying what are the taxonomies of, of worldviews that have certain structural cohesive 
integrated aspects to them that we could look at through time to see what is held as sacred in these different worldviews and these different cultural configurations and why. And do these actually, are they measurable at different levels of, say, hierarchical complexity in terms of where they show up? And some of my current research is actually directly related to testing those kinds of hypotheses. And I also, you know, people should know this, and I think this is why it can be very, oh, there's so much to this, but those that kind of warrior, if not rapist, then at least uh, destroyer uh, ideal as sacred is in the, let us say, it is enshrined as well in the scriptural tradition of the West. If you read the book of Joshua, for example, uh, in Judges. Ah, yeah, I love Joshua. Every 10 years, I read the Pentateuch plus Joshua. And as I say, why do you read Joshua too? I said, if I want to read the joke, I want the punchline, uh, (laughs) where Yahweh actually shows what he's really all about, a goddamn psychopathic paranoid. So, And as I often will say after that, I'll say, and if uh, Yahweh exists, I'm on the other side. Well, and, and I mean, these are really profound, I mean, you know, great theological questions. What got me started exploring meaning was my own grappling with these issues theologically, because I had to deal with that. I'm like, hey, how do we integrate this aspect of the warrior, the divine warrior into, you know, this notion of divine compassion and love? It didn't make sense to me. And that can lead a lot of people to like deconstruct and just give up on the meaning thing entirely. But what I am looking for is a sweet spot where people listening to this could hear that all of this is true. But once you frame that in a broader context that the sacred itself is evolving, then we can appreciate that actually these met certain adaptive requirements at the time and that they were of lesser degrees of complexity. And to the degree that this is itself caught up in a universal learning process in which humanity itself is learning and learning meaning and value better or at least more complexly over time, then uh, of course we should expect to see an evolution of con- concepts of, of God and the sacred and value. And that is indeed precisely what a lot, anyway, of the historical record does reveal, at least when we examine the better angels of our nature. And so I find that to be a very inspiring story and trying to trace that is is a, a, a big inspiration for me in this project. So I agree, all that's there. And then, you know, what we make of it, I think is we can be more or less sophisticated with these sorts of things. And I would agree also with your analysis around the turbulence that we're finding ourselves in, right? I mean, we're undergoing a collective phase transition where there's a lot of instability and chaos introduced into the system. And in in a large part, that's because of the decomposition of our meaning structures and value structures. And for us now, the question is, well, what's next? Do we change that viscosity dial and just go back to some like, oh, no, actually what we really did need is just some kind of medieval notion of an absolute or something, right? Or do we find some other kind of even more complex notion of the sacred, you know, on the other side of our current collective problem? And that's what my work is sort of trying to gesture to ultimately is that people especially right now who feel like they have to choose, you know, oh, well, is it is the sacred just some old religion-y woo stuff or or do I have to choose science and, and you know, whatever? This is this like false binary. There's a false dichotomy there where actually, you know, science has its own notions of the sacred, you could say. And, uh, and what we, I think, are heading towards is a radically complexifying world that is a dissipative structure that's just, you know, relatively historically speaking, and certainly geologically speaking, a second ago discovered all these untapped energy resources. So all this energy is flowing into the system, blowing up the, you know, kind of organizational structure that had existed by means of which these collectives kind of maintain themselves through justification systems. And now we're like, how do we put these pieces back together in a way uh, that is suitable to the complexity of the moment that we find ourselves in? And ultimately, this work is an effort to try to articulate a notion of the sacred that can meet us there and say, hey, yeah, we can actually do this sacred thing and we need to. And meaning and value. Yeah, those are real without falling into old kind of absolutist, essentialist, transcendentalist, wooey positions that actually aren't of a uh, requisite complexity to meet the moment. I love it. I am so looking forward to uh, these other books. Believe it or not, all this extremely detailed conversation we just had for two hours is a relatively light gloss on <laughs> Brendan's 94-page book. Uh, and, it, and I will also say the book is extremely well-written. It's very clear. It's very <laughs> elegant. Uh, and I don't do this very often, but I'm going to tell you people, 
buy this book. Uh, if you don't, I'm going to come kick your ass. Uh, so, uh, no, I'm serious. This is a, uh, one of the best books I've read in years. I mean, wow. seriously. And, I, and, and regular listeners know, I don't say that very often, but once every five years, maybe. So uh, anyway, I really want to thank uh, Brendan for first writing a book this good, A Universal Learning Process, The Evolution of Meaning, book one, as it's shown on Amazon. <laughs> uh, what a weird ass title, but hey, we discussed that earlier. And I uh, really look forward to having you back as you crank out the rest of these books. Thank you so much, Jim. I've already got around 100 pages of the next volume, so hopefully it won't be too long before that comes out. And I look forward, I relish the, the possibility of a, of a future conversation and really appreciate you uh, taking the time. This was great. Audio production and editing by Andrew Blevins Productions. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.